Welcome to this special podcast series from the National Institute for Health and Care Research about the future of research. You'll be hearing from five clinicians who are the current Thames Valley and South Midlands Clinical Research Network Fellows. We will be discussing the big research challenges facing healthcare. I'm Dr. Sanjay Ramakrishnan. I'm a research fellow in respiratory medicine at the University of Oxford. And over four episodes, I'll be asking my colleagues the tough questions. Are we getting trial participants who are representative of our diverse population? Is our research workforce ready for the future? Is it all going to be online? Join us to get answers to all these tough questions. The title of the podcast today is The Future of Research. Can we go full digital? The digital revolution is happening in healthcare. Is research there? What opportunities and challenges does this provide? To discuss this topic, I'm joined by Mittal, Laura, and Tanya. To start with, could I just ask each of you to introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, I'm Laura Taylor. I'm a research optometrist. I work at Oxford Eye Hospital, and I see patients with inherited retinal conditions who are taking part in clinical trials. My research work is centered on improving the vision testing then used in these ophthalmic trials. Hi, my name is Dr. Mittal Shah. I'm an ophthalmology registrar and I work at the Oxford Eye Hospital. And over the last six years, I've been involved in the running and delivery of a number of different clinical trials. And my research focuses on the use of retinal imaging and artificial intelligence in ophthalmology. Hi, I'm Dr. Tanya Barron. I'm an emergency medicine consultant in Oxford and I've previously been a GP. I'm involved in various trials within the emergency research and chair our local patient and public involvement group. My passion is to make research accessible to everybody and to ensure it's a normal part of patient care. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, team. Um, so we, I think it's fair to say health research has not kept up with the wider digital revolution that is already happening. I think even in the, in the wider healthcare space, uh, how much of it is done electronically is probably quite far ahead of what is done in day-to-day research practice. Um, it starts from recruitment to consent to get a collection to follow up and dissemination. We we think it's there. The patients want it. Patients expect it. They're always surprised by how much paper we use. So I guess we can start from some scratch. When you join a study, you, you participant signs a consent form, and that's where it starts. Literally, a piece of paper as a wet signature on a piece of paper. And there are studies now that are moving quite quickly towards e-consent, again, pushed quite quickly uh, by COVID. And Tanya, you would have a lot of experience with this. How does it work for you? How does your department handle electronic consent? So I think within the emergency department, we had started to move towards electronic consent before COVID, but COVID really accelerated things. So the trials all became um, electronic consent and it's worked really well for us. It saves you having lots of pieces of paper everywhere. Um, it's obviously greener for the environment. Um, and actually, patients have responded well to this. The research nurses obviously still come and talk to the patient, explain the trial, but the patient information sheet will probably be online, but also a paper uh, available. Um, and then the patient go through the consent form electronically on an iPad usually um, and um, yeah we've had no problem at all we're able to clean the iPads between each patient um, and it's as I say been great to be able to enter the information directly onto the um, platform that we're using for the study data as well. And there's all sorts of hybrid levels of this you know there's everything from you, you still do a standard conversation and only the last bit, instead of there being an actual signature, you, you're doing it online. Or there are uh, a, great, a good example is the COVID-19 vaccine study where groups of, to get patients through as quickly as possible, groups of um, volunteers would go, come and sit in a room, socially distance, watch a, uh, a video recording of someone explaining the vaccine study, and then if they had any questions, they would ask in that group setting to someone in the front. It's almost like a classroom and everyone gets their answered questions commonly and then everyone signs their uh, a consent form electronically at the end of that of that session, like a 45-minute session for consent for a group of people. And then the final step is 
everything online. You, you read your information sheet online, you watch videos online, you can call and ask questions if you like, and you sign a consent form online. That's it. That's your consent process done. Obviously, very different um, each stage. Is there any, any, anything, any issues with that, Laura? What do you, do you think that any particular stage of that could be, could be done better? Is, or should we, or should we all be just doing all consent at home online patients is reading their own videos or reading their own things? I, I think, I think I've got quite strong opinions on this. I, I'm all for sharing information online or, you know, through a, a video or, um, having documents available, emailing information to patients, and even emailing the, inf- the consent form in advance. Um, but in my opinion, I think there needs to be for informed consent, truly informed consent for any condition, for any procedure or research. I think there needs to be a face to face or a telephone back and forth conversation with a human being, not a computer, um, where there is understanding from both sides that you know they you, know, you understand what you're agreeing to and you have the opportunity to openly ask questions if you've got a silly question you might not feel like you could email it if it's done if you're emailing a consent and filling it out on your own at home you might not feel you could ask a silly question whereas if you have that opportunity to have a conversation with someone also if you're when i'm consenting someone the idea is you you make sure that the patient or the participant understands and relays back to you what they're consenting to. And I don't think you can do that, um, you know, electronically without engaging with the patient. Um, so I, I think there's a scope for to use digital resources in consenting. I think it can speed up the process. I think it can make information a lot more accessible. You know, in the eye hospital, if we had more information available, uh, online or in electronic resources it you know we could make it bigger for visually impaired patients they could use their um you know they have special dev- computer devices at home to magnify things up to make it clearer to read i think that's great but i still think there needs to be a face to face or telephone conversation you know, I, <clears throat> I disagree slightly uh, with what laura said and i think uh, personally i'm a huge proponent of um moving things forward and, and into a sort of a digital context. Um, I think above all, look, it's important to remember that there's always going to be um, certain groups of people who may not be either uh, digitally literate or savvy or potentially have access to digital resources in order to be able to take part in that. So I think there should always be a provision for those people so they're not excluded from um, potential research uh, projects going forward. But I think the whole process of consent um, is just that. It's not... A, a, a signature on a, on a form, be that a wet signature on a bit of paper or a electronic signature on an electronic form, it's a process. And I think taking that into consideration, um, it will depend on the study that's in question. Um, if you've got something that's um, an interventional study, let's say it's delivering a new treatment and that treatment needs to be given by an invasive procedure, your whole consent process is going to be completely different um, to a small qualitative study which just uses a short, really short questionnaire which may take two minutes to fill in um, to answer a different research question. And in that latter example where it's just a a few questions to answer, um, if it's really straightforward, the participant information sheet um, surely will explain everything there in enough detail. And as long as there's always an option for people to get in touch, it may not actually require anybody to to pick up the phone and and call them to check the patient's okay or the participant's okay um, uh, or otherwise, or, or even to have a face-to-face discussion. It may be something that can be done entirely online. Um, but I understand if it was something more invasive, you'd want to have <clears throat> more opportunities to check that the participant understands what's going on um, and to give them an opportunity to ask questions um, going forward as well. So I think it's a process, and I think I definitely wouldn't let this pr- prevent or yeah, prevent um, sort of us progressing towards that direction. I guess uh, taking Laura's side on this, it's all a matter of degrees, isn't it, Mitchell? It's 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 a matter of drawing a line, saying this is okay to not require a phone call, but this does, and in degree of invasiveness is different for everyone. Even the the four of us on here will decide different things that are not invasive. You know, I'm a chest physician. I put cameras into people's lungs, and I don't think that's I think that's minimally invasive. 
but my patient said, you are absolutely out of your mind. That's absolutely invasive. So it, it's a line that you, you draw. Who, who draws that line? I think that's a line that's drawn, taking everyone's account or everyone's um, opinion into account. So the researchers who are setting up the study, of course, the participants, um, or like through PPI, uh, patient and participant in, in sort of uh, groups, uh, and also the research ethical uh, committee and, and the checks and balances that go in um, before a study is even um, given the green light to go ahead. So you're taking, or you, you're trying to make sure you get a, a, a wide ranging opinion um, on whether it's considered to be appropriate or invasive or not, and therefore to make sure that your consent process um, sort of stacks up to, to, to your study that you're, you're trying to set up. I think when you're uh, consenting someone in person, I mean, again, it does depend on the level of invasiveness of the study or the treatment, but you kind of judge that person's uh, behavior, um, you know, their persona. Are they emotionally, are they in a good place to take part in this study or are they in a good place to, to do the treatment? And you can't get that judgment or gain that judgment if it's done on a digital form online where you don't see that person or you don't speak to that person. And I think I, I, it loses the human aspect human aspect of it, and I think that's sad. <laughs> I think it was very much dependent on the trial, as um, Mita was saying as well. I'm do, we're doing a study just now, actually, in the emergency department where it's all just been online by email for consent. And I think as long as the researcher is accessible and easily accessible, then I think that's not unreasonable. So the, the next step after consent, all research is about data and how you collect data. And again, the vast majority of the time, there is one database that collects data that we blood tests or, or x-rays, something else, how a patient feels, blood pressure. And there's another database, it's a secure database that we then transfer that information this case to the next one and that in itself is its own training program we, we sometimes call it good clinical practice training but that's a whole training that goes into that but that step doesn't need to exist and one of the great things that the nhs provides researchers is something we call nhs digi trials so for things that are very very clear-cut you're either alive or you're you've died unfortunately or you you either have cancer that's progressed or cancer that hasn't progressed you either have pneumonia or not. Why don't we just see if someone presents to hospital with something to consider that was the outcome that you're testing? That's NHS Digital that now provides this information to researchers after they have ethical approval to say, if the patient's already agreed, can they? Can we just not see them again? They don't have to be followed up. There's less burden on the patients. We just wait to see if the event happens, the event in question that we're worried about happens, and then the NHS digital process will provide the information to the study. Um, Mittal, I think I already know where you're going to stand on this. Yeah, so again, um, I think I'm a, a, a huge proponent. So the NHS has one, I mean, it's got lots of valuable resources, but one resource in particular that's extremely valuable is all the data that it holds. I think it's an I think on a, on a practical day-to-day -day level, um, sometimes it can be difficult because sometimes these bits, data sets are sort of siloed in, in different areas within the NHS or different programs. Um, <clears throat> but I think something like this, um, where you're able to, to pull that um, data, it's able to be sent off securely and anonymized or pseudonymized to researchers who have got approved research projects going on, or potentially even NHS digital trials can be used by potential researchers with approved research studies to <clears throat> try to identify where their potential participants might be so they can work out which areas of the country, for example, might be good research sites because this condition that they're interested in looking into, it, it's, it happens to be more common in a particular part of the country. Um, but this it has benefits both for researchers because you're less likely to lose participants over time because they've moved out of the country, or not out of the country, sorry, if they've moved out of the area, et cetera, or they've changed GP practice. It also means it's less burden on the participant having to come back in. If this is data that's being collected anyway, why are we then asking participants to come back to a hospital or another base where we can ask these questions again, where the data is actually being collected on its own already? 
So yeah, I'm a, a proponent of. Oh, so do we lose the the gratitude that we we are deeply in, indebted to these trial participants? Are, are we do they do are we still providing that extra service that we should be providing? I think it depends what the research study is for. I mean, I think NHS did you trials, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it lends itself to sort of big data studies, you know, looking at, is it looking at overall big outcomes or big epidemiological studies? And from that aspect, I think it has, certainly has a place. Um, but I think if you've given a patient a new intervention, I think it's, I think you'll lose. You'll potentially risk losing information if you're not going to follow them up. You know, yes, you, if you're giving patients, you've got two groups. One patient takes aspirin for pneumonia, following pneumonia, and the other patient doesn't. But just by looking at NHS study trials to see which patients had the longest life expectancy following that, how do you know which patients had better qualities of life? That data is not collected, and so potentially you run the risk of of missing out on valuable information. Uh, Tanya, Laura touched on the, the, the magic, not magic word, the quality data. And you, you're again in the, the perfect person to talk about this. One classic example in respiratory disease is, is um, what is the difference between bronchitis and pneumonia? You know, you deal with this every day. Uh, it's the most common uh, data problem. If someone codes, it's, just, it's possible that someone is incorrectly labeled pneumonia, especially if the person seeing them is not senior enough or not experienced enough when they just had bronchitis or the other way around, they might have had pneumonia. Uh, they might have had pneumonia, but they were incorrectly labeled as bronchitis. And that's it. There's no way of checking. How, how does that impact your, your data collection for your studies? As I was saying before, we've got such a huge wealth of data coming in through the department every day. We have patients with all sorts of things and a lot of patient contact. And I think one thing that is being, is being worked on um, by the College of Emergency Medicine is trying to improve the collection of data because we have such, as I say, a wealth of data, but actually the systems for collecting it and then for analysing afterwards are are not have not been great historically um, and so if somebody comes in with one particular issue you could end up being coded something completely different and then when you're trying to search the data um, in the future it's very difficult to know whether you're ac accurately representing what you're what you're looking for um, but I mean it's identified as a problem and is being worked hard on so Hopefully that will improve. Yeah, so I think I agree with what sort of Tanya was saying there about so the, that labelling of data, your example that you give, Sanjay, or is this bronchitis or is this pneumonia, um, <clears throat> that's routinely collected data. So that's data that's been collected as part of that patient's normal NHS care that they would have sought for, uh, that they would have sought um, sort of intervention or, or help for. And I think it's important researchers who are looking to use that kind of data um, need to, and I'm sure will understand that it comes with certain limitations. Um, but the potential benefits there are you've got studies which are that data is still able to answer certain questions. It's not going to be able to answer all questions. And Laura mentioned before, but if you've got a new study and you want to look at health related quality of life versus um, one treatment versus another treatment, fine, that data is not necessarily going to be able to give you that. Um, but I think it's related to what your research question is. Um, so I think there's still huge scope for using the, the, the data that's there and, and already accessible there. Um, it will make studies potentially complete uh, more efficiently than they would otherwise. Um, it may reduce costs related to research if you don't have to get paid participants to come back in again. And for participants, from their point of view, if it's a case of, yes, I'm happy for you to use this data, which is being collected anyway for this important research question, they can be involved in the study, but again, from their point of view, it's less inconvenient for them to have to then be followed up and things like that as well. Yeah, and a lot of studies are moving that way. Partly, some of them had to for the pandemic, but now people realize that you know people could fill out questionnaires, patient report outcomes, quality of life data. It, it doesn't need to involve actually physically coming to a clinic. It can be done from home. And that is another great change that has happened a lot due to the pandemic. But moving all the way back to recruitment, you know, uh, you sort of touched on using the digital data to guide to where to go. 
But one of the big things that the NIHR is doing is setting up the B part of research database. And um, it's encouraging members of the public to go and sign themselves up to be contacted if the study opens that's relevant to them um, and also self-identify studies to join. Can we leverage the NHS data even more? Can, can they send the uh, patient studies when something opens based on routinely collected data? So you get a notification on your app saying, hey, there's a new study that's open locally. Do you, are you interested? Um, is that okay? Is that too invasive? Um, I I think that would be okay. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem every time I log into the NHS app, I get a ping or a notification to say, oh, there's a study in your area that could be relevant. You've got if you've got asthma, you know, there's a new asthma study in your area. This might be relevant to you. Click here for more information. I think, you know, I might not have gone out of my way to look for it, but if it pops into my inbox or as say on the app on my phone. It might prompt me to to do that, and I think I don't see that as a as a bad thing. Um, certainly not. I think we're used to having notifications and pop ups these days on our phones. Yeah, I I think I, I'd agree again uh, there with what Laura said. I think the one thing to bear in mind is if um, someone has opted out um, for their data to be shared. Um, sort of at that level, let's say at, from an interest digital or from the spine, then there's potentially going to be a pool of participants who may not be notified uh, about research studies uh, where they may have opted out for the data not to be shared, but not necessarily have realized that the implications and things that that could have had as well. So um, I think that's potentially important to bear in mind as well. Yeah, I think I like the idea of making it as easily accessible as possible for people to be involved in research so that it's very quick and easy. And if they just have to click on, yes, I'll be involved in that and hey, presto, they're off. Um, but I think, again, we have to be mindful that one of the big goals is to ensure that we're inclusive, inclusive and actually are we putting more barriers up by doing it that way? Are we going to bias the participants again because they're going to be people who are sort of proactively sort of involved in research or or is it just another way of getting more people involved and does it actually matter? I think I disagree because there's more people these days that have access to computers and smartphones and especially in the UK. I think we're quite lucky. Quite a lot of people have digital access. I think there's more people that do than don't. And I think as time goes on, you know, I think that group of people that do not have access is going to get smaller and smaller. But it's still going to be the people in the groups we're trying to already include more that are probably going to miss out. I think there's always going to be small areas of society who may not have access to the internet or computers or smartphones. So I think whatever research study and um, no matter how far this sort of digital push goes, I think there always has to be a, a, a fallback. Um, one, to, to make sure that those participants aren't, or potential participants aren't excluded. And two, if a, if a participant comes along who is able to use it, but says, you know what, I want to see a pure paper and I want to come in and talk to you and I don't mind coming in and talking to you and signing a consent form, with a pen rather than electronically, um, I think there always should be an option available for those if, if that's what you'd like. Um, moving slightly on, I've got a different question which we've not discussed, and I was wondering what your opinions. I had a conversation recently with someone, and they were talking about how uh, you know your your smartphone data that tracks your everyday life and your everyday movements, or how um, your internet usage, what you browse, or how big you have the font on your phone or the brightness on your phone can be help can be used with artificial intelligence to monitor for certain health conditions and can then be used to send a warning of perhaps you know low mood or a certain health condition and recommend you get help or gp or i just wondered is that something we should i mean it falls into digital and slightly into research because it's a it's a new thing um what do you guys think of that? Is that something we should? Is that something we should be, take, you know, embracing? Yeah, I I think that's a great point. Actually, that's very relevant to our discussion. Um, it is routinely collected data. 
right? It is data that we're collecting every day, every second. Everyone else uses it. Amazon uses it to target what to sell us. Um, why can't we use it for research? Why, if we can pick up uh, macular degeneration earlier by doing that, uh, if we pick up um, depression earlier based on the kind of videos you engage with on social media, um, what is that? You know, where do we draw the line? Where we go from healthcare to minority report? You know, where do, where do we sit on that on that um, on that on that uh, Continuum. What about what? What do you think, Tanya uh, Mattel? I don't know. I have to say, it sounds pretty intrusive. I've already had adverts for the the um, podcast recording company on my phone this lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if somebody then, so if I started then getting pop up saying you might be depressed because you've looked at this thing, I think I'd probably be slightly. I don't know. It seems like it's maybe overstepping what we're used to. Um, but. Maybe that maybe that is the way to go. Yeah. And Mattel is the AI researcher here, and you know he he knows more about what's happening in this field, especially you know, DeepMind AI doing a lot of work in this field. Um, what 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 is going on in this field, Mattel? So I mean, <clears throat> within an op an ophthalmology context, um, so that certainly within ophthalmology, there's lots of interest um, in using the data that we collect um, and. One big thing in ophthalmology is, is retinal imaging. So that's images that are taken of the, of the back of the eye and trying to use automated means through artificial intelligence or machine learning um, to be able to diagnose people um, automatically without the need for, a, for an ophthalmologist or, or an optometrist or an, any other healthcare practitioner. And potentially even trying to be able to use that information to predict when someone might need treatment or, or when things may change, which is something that we can't do at the moment. So. I think there's a lot of um, interest in the area. I think there's a lot of um, promise in the area and people are hopeful that big things will come of it. Um, and I think as with anything else, the research will tell us um, what works and what doesn't work. I mean, there are already, um, or well, there's already at the very least one AI driven program, uh, which was approved in the USA for, for automatically grading uh, or monitoring or identifying, I should say, diabetic retinopathy um, from, from retinal images. Um, so I think time will tell. Uh, I think more stuff is coming out. There's certainly lots of research within the area. Um, and, and how that fits into our day-to-day -day clinical work, um, we will see. Now on that note, I think we can end on that hopeful, optimistic note. Researchers have nothing if not optimistic to say that there is so much potential in this data world and, and the human side of data. You know, what, what having this digital access allows the humans involved to achieve and how it changes the, the experience for our participants. There's so much that can be gained by going digital in research and I think today we proved that there's this, an endless stream of opportunities. Thank you to Laura, Tanya and Mittal so much for joining and thank you to the listeners. Thank you for listening to this special podcast series from the NIHR. If you are a member of the public interested in research, please visit the Be Part of Research website to search for studies near you that you can take part in. For health workers who want to find out more, please visit the NIHR Your Path in Research website to get started. If you have specific research training and research career-related questions, please speak to your local friendly NIHR Clinical Research Network.